Good morning. Hey. Good morning, Good everybody. Morning. How are you going? Hello. Good. All right. Happy Saturday morning. Happy Hope Saturday. Everyone... Yeah, happy Saturday. Has everyone had like a good week? Very yeah. good. Yeah. It was the longest week in January that we've had. <laughs> yeah. It was certainly very cold. Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. I went out to take my dog this morning and my hair froze and I was like, all right. Oh, it's January. Yeah. So. Well, um, I think we'll get started here in just a couple minutes and people will trickle in as that happens. Um, to this week we're going over genres of photography. So um, we're really gonna be diving into a bunch of different ways to you know, photograph landscapes or food um, and you know, revisiting some of our like portrait and fashion photography. Um, but that's what we're doing this week and then Next week, I think, is our last official class. And then the week after that, we're doing a discussion. So mm -hmm. it's where we can see each other's work. We can talk kind of casually, um, talk about maybe some of the pictures you've taken along with the course or what you've been working on or will be working on um, or you know what you love about photography and just kind of a casual chat session since we, you know, Zoom, it's sometimes hard for people to have that kind of conversation. So we're going to be doing that. So. I think we're gonna get started here. Um, please. Can know. I ask, uh, how are you going to, how are we doing these photographs? Are we, are we sending them to you and you're putting them up or how we, how we displaying our, our photos? Yeah, so we can do it. Uh, we can do it that way if it's easier, but we can also screen share. So if you have, um, it might not be enabled for everybody, but um, what I can, what we can do is actually show other images on our computers. But oh, it might okay. be easier if you haven't done that on Zoom before. You can just send them to me via email as JPEGs, and I can I can screen share from there. So um, I think that would be great if you're able to do that, um, and and we can be kind of flexible with it. It doesn't have to be a formal presentation or anything. So mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we dive in today? Okay, yeah. well then let's do it. All right. Okay, so photography 101, here we go. All right, you are all seeing this screen, yes? As it loads? Perfect. Okay, so as, as kind of every week, every, every time I like make these, I get too excited and there's always too many slides. But it's photography genres, which means we should really have a lot of, um, we should have a lot of images to look through and that's what we're going to do. So we're gonna start off with food photography. So food photography relies a lot on natural light to make it feel kind of, to feel good, um, but also to make it feel um, natural. So, this light you see here, it's really soft. It's not harsh light like a spotlight. And it looks a lot like this. So no, I'm just gonna, great. So it looks, this setup, so you have the window there and that window is giving you a lot of light and it's doing it kind of in a very soft way. That little white thing there is acting to diffuse the light. So if you have say like a white bed sheet or some like a piece of paper, that would act to diffuse the light. So you can see the setup here for how you might be photographing that. Um, and you can also use um, inanimate objects, much like we talked about eyes last week. So the eye, you see those little circles in the eye where the light's coming through. These you can see along this like bottle here that the light is coming through on that right side. This is another example of a nice setup. You've got that big window light. You can have a light behind if you want to give it an extra pop, but you don't have to. Um, and then you can see how this is photographing here with the um, computer that's showing you. So you have a really well lit uh, food situation. So and a lot of time in food photography, they do what's called a lay flat look. And that's when you shoot from above and it's uh, or, or flat lay. Um, and so 
this you can see it's kind of messy it's really colorful um, and you can see all of these different colors coming through and in the composition so don't be afraid to include different ingredients um, different some of your you know fancy dishes and things um, but you can also use things that maybe you wouldn't use as as often um, that might be kind of look well loved um, and a lot of times people have these kind of organic things, things that have this kind of shape to them, like a napkin, um, that's gonna have some nice shape. And this, you have the really bright colors of the fruit with this, and I mean, I would never eat my granola and then spill it intentionally, but it gives it this kind of put together look that is really popular in food photography right now. Um, and this is another just example of a flat lay there. Um, and, and you can even bring in things that weren't in the food originally, like this has ivy and this purple tea towel. Um, and <clears throat> the background of it almost looks like a, you know, just a, just a metal background. <clears throat> so, and you can also go about photographing food in a totally different style than is normally considered proper, because a lot of like candy stores will have their own vision for what they want to be or you know Hershey's will photograph differently than Giardelli so you can start to think about how photography might elevate the product or make it whimsical or make it feel like a very specific brand. So um, this is one example where they used harsh photography so harsh light so you see that harsh light there coming that shadow underneath the candy um, that's that's more like a spotlight direct sunlight you can see the direction it's coming in from the top right there, but it's also like illuminating those gummies. You can see the light coming through them. And I think that's like a fun way that people normally don't uh, utilize. So Martin Parr, um, he's one of my favorite photographers. And he was a, he's a British photographer who photographed all sorts of things from how we vacation to how we eat. Um, <clears throat> and he photographed food kind of, um, Kind of in a way that we wouldn't want to see in a magazine because the food was like this is not this does not look like an appetizing picture but in many ways it's a very cultural experience so you don't necessarily have to photograph food looking beautiful but if you're photographing like a tea time in in england as this kind of cultural moment that's also something to consider um and also just how perhaps gross some food is um sometimes when you get a macro lens on a steak it's really it can be a little gross um so like this image, for example, can have a very kind of visceral reaction that's different than if you were to utilize, you know, a sausage that's been cooked and prepared and is beautifully done um, than this image. And um, <clears throat> so he uses harsh light as opposed to like soft window light. Um, and he's definitely doing more of this kind of documentary style um, when he's looking at food. So food photography really has been for Instagram, um, for, for kind of contemporary understanding of food photography, we're using a window, it's very soft light, but this is a totally different mood. And it's important that while you can understand the kind of convention of food photography, you can also understand what it means to break it. So this, this food has kind of an almost ominous look to it with the harsh light. You know, I'm now very aware of maybe the calories or the sugar or that this probably isn't as good for me. Um, then if he had like set it up in this almost, you know, organic environment with this nice window light. So light can really change how you feel about a place and, um, and how you stage it too. So this is on kind of that tablecloth that you would expect at like a Greek restaurant. And, you know, it, this tablecloth, though it doesn't say anything about that, you can start to conceptualize where it might be, you know, versus if it was a kind of you know, white tablecloth might not have anything, but maybe a wood, you know, looks like a picnic table. It's giving you different context for the food. Um, <clears throat> nothing like a good cookie cake, right? This is still Martin Parr. Um, and we're just seeing different ways that people are interacting with food for that. Um, and still life photography, using a lot of the same lighting techniques and um, composition. So still life photography, we're kind of based now talking about this in the painting um, tradition. So um, painting, they would set up the still lives, they would paint from them. And we're seeing that they're still using a lot of the same lighting techniques that we can use today. Um, and whether you're in a studio or at your house or wherever you are, um, I think studio 
like still life photography can be really beautiful. So if you start to look at these paintings and find kind of this inspiration, these paintings were very about like, you know, too much and kind of this excess um, where we can see here, like that's just a lot of grapes. Um, and it just like becomes this kind of a lot is going on in these compositions. And so that's kind of a tie into the art historical part. So you can photograph them like this. It's kind of very much side lighting. Um, you can see even in here, it's really soft the way they've painted with the light, but you can still see the shadows. Like look at the shell. You can see the shadow of the shell, the shadow of the grapes. You can clearly see the lights somewhat directional, but it's not very bright. And the uh, background is pretty, it's not well lit. So um, there have been contemporary photographers that utilize this language to create new ways of thinking about food photography and to tie into the tradition. So like this taco 12 pack, for example, um, it's using the same lighting systems. It's, you know, tying into this rich tradition of still life painting, but um, focusing on Taco Bell tacos. Um, and what we can see if, again, like the eye, this um, Taco Bell, what Baja Blast has that line on it of light that's coming through. So we can see the light is coming from um, front left and giving it just that little bit so that you can see the shadows in the background are getting deeper. Um, and this is a great, uh, great food photography piece that is, you can do still lives from above, straight on. Um, and the apples, the shine there, that is coming from where the light is. And this is, uh, this is something you can do with a phone, with your camera, with your you know, DSLR. Um, and you can also start to play with different kind of, there's so much styling in food photography and in still life photography. So um, being prepared to set it up for a while before you get it. You know, if you're looking to, if you want to play more with the camera than the subject, um, I find that still life photography is really about bringing in elements that are visually pleasing. So like this, for example, this drink is Chobani. It's an apple cucumber beverage and they like very much have this minimalist branding. And here we have apples and cucumbers and this like pink for the apple and green for the cucumber coming in through the scene as well. Um, and you know what they're trying to do is show you that um, it's a very natural um, thing, but this is somewhat harsher lighting as we can see with that uh, shadow there. So lay flat photography, we talked about it a little bit um, and they're kind of characterized as telling stories from above. And so when you're looking at lay flat photography, thinking about what story you want to tell or what story that the photographer wanted to tell. So again, lighting is everything use. Um, so I would use simple surfaces to get the point across um, because what you want to do is, and, and lay flat photography is very popular right now on Instagram with brands um, and with like bloggers and that sort of thing. So it's often about um, creating a tale. So. So like, for example, the one on the left, we have um, someone in bed eating all sorts of got like candy and, you know, pastries. They like fashion, they have roses, they have this like fluffy pillow and chalk and, and coffee, um, which is like something I would never be laying in bed being like perfect, beautiful spread. So something to think about as you're setting these up is they're very much in the stylistic choices, same as kind of food photography. So, you know, if you're trying to take a picture of a postcard, you might be like, it's just a postcard, but maybe then you want to bring in um, nests or eggs, I guess, or flowers or a pen, and it becomes a lot more involved. Um, but you can start to tell someone's personality through a lay flat photograph or the story. So this might be, you know, we can start to come up with our assumptions of who this person is. Um, we can start to see that maybe this person's a, someone who's creative. They have a camera and a computer and a phone and they've got their glasses and coffee. You know, this one, you can see they're somewhat, you know, detail oriented. They've got their, you know, sunglasses and they're maybe quite hip and all of these things that we can start to pull from. And this is also really popular in wedding photography to get like the um, RSVP cards and the rings and have all of these little details 
together and often done with like ribbon or flowers. Um, but that simple background so that you can see each of these things and be able to um, really encounter them in a special way. And this is another version of lay flat photography. Um, and a lot of people do this to document their lives in a prettier way for Instagram. You know, it's a big reason people use it. Um, but it's also fun to just kind of play around with what your day could look like in this kind of highly aestheticized uh, way. So, and, and this could be one if you're like, oh, I am working with a local coffee shop and they have this new turmeric chai latte and I want to photograph it in a way that will draw people's attention. This might be a way that you go about that. You know, it's this, you've got maybe almonds and all these different spices and then there's this little cookie here. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. And some, some can be more complicated than others. You know, this is a pretty complicated one. Um, this one is another wedding photography one. So you've got the actual like, and, and a lot of people pay a lot of money for these, these paper goods for their weddings. And so having some sort of photograph to um, memorialize them forever after they're done. So, and it can be about your job. Maybe you're, maybe you're a painter and you want to do a lay flat photograph about the different paints you're using and like what your day might look like. Uh, and I, I think it's a really fun way to kind of communicate that in a, in a beautiful way. And you can also make kind of fun phone backgrounds. You can take, you know, your bag of cherries and put them on a, you know, large cardboard, you know, large cardstock paper and create a phone background. Um, and I think that that is just a really fun way to do it. And I want to dive in a little bit to how much work goes into lay flat photography. Because like from looking at it from here, it's like, oh, like they put their stuff out. But like this is so <laughs> this is a champagne bottle, right? We've got a card on the side there on the bottom right. We've got a pen thing. We've got frozen raspberries. We've got marshmallows. We've got uh, maybe nectarines. Uh, we got more marshmallow things. We've got dried flowers. We've got, you know, these two glasses with champagne in it, which means there's another champagne bottle around. There's two roses, excuse me, two roses. And then there's a bunch of like potpourri around. And like, that's for one shot, which is to me a lot more than you might do on say a normal Sunday. So if you're looking to do these, just really think about all the elements because you don't want to show up with like two things and try to do a lay flat photography because normally it requires several subjects to kind of back it up uh, when you're working on this. But you could also do just grapes. You can make it playful, you can make it fun. Um, I think this is a really great photograph because it's just, it really is just grapes, but it, it feels very playful to me. So, and again, in food photography, they do this as well. And we can see where that light's coming from. It's kind of shining in there and it's really soft. Um, but they've, they've shown you some of the spices and the ways that they're working here. And it's kind of messy in a fun way, but really the lighting's beautiful. And you start to kind of understand some of the importance of like the spices and the herbs in this piece. So sports photography. I know some of you are interested in sports photography. So we're going to dive in. Um, there are, there's at least one photograph where someone has some blood on their nose. I'll try to call it out before it happened. But if that's something that you're like, I don't, I don't want to see that, uh, go ahead and uh, close your eyes and, you know, get a cup of coffee or something. Um, because I, I think sports photography is a lot about telling stories. So this quote, first take advantage of whatever it is that you have access to. Don't buy a ticket to a professional game and take your camera in there and shoot from the upper deck or wherever you're seated just because it's a professional team or a famous athlete. Instead, finding local things at your school in your neighborhood that you have access to so you can really get up in there and shoot with a purpose. So this, this to me is just really important um, because a lot of times we can get overwhelmed by, you know, if I'm not photographing the thing, I'm not doing it, but you don't have to be photographing, you know, the Red Sox for it to be successful sports photography. So this is a typical sports photographer setup. We can see we have a huge lens here that's being held on what's called a monopod. So you're probably used to tripods that have three. A monopod is singular. It'll still hold the camera pretty steady, but it allows them the flexibility to um, 
it allows them the flexibility to move around quickly. Sorry, my cat is trying to play with my dog and my dog is not having it. And they're running around a little bit. Um, so here we can see a whole group of them. You can see those big lenses um, and you, you can see those monopods here as they're photographing. So this is kind of a typical press core setup for sports photography. Um, that's the bloody nose. And so sports photography can be as much about that catch, um, you know, that, that moment as it is about everything behind the scenes. Because, you know, as we know in sports, it's as much about, you know, putting in the practice and the hours behind the scenes to get that, to get into shape for that. So I think a lot of the sports photography that people can love is the ones that have the, the stories behind them that, that you can understand people better. Of course, if you're able to get really great photographs like this one, that's awesome. Um, and we can see this. So, so talking just compositionally and with what we've been talking about with like the technical, what we have here is a very fast image, you know, it's taken with a quick shutter speed. We can see that the, you know, ball and the people are in focus. Um, but as you get further back, you can't really see the people which is kind of good because if they were totally in focus, I think, you know, I would be distracted by their faces. So this is something to consider when you're shooting sports photography, you don't have a lot of control. You don't have control of the lighting, you don't have control of the people or the movement, um, and you don't have control of what's in the background. So in this being able to differentiate with that shallower depth of field means that we can more clearly see some of these key players here. Um, and this is a, another example of sports photography. And again, you can see it's a shallower depth of field. We can't see that person's face in the background, but we can see the players, we can see them in perfect clarity. So just something to consider as you're shooting sports photography. Um, and we can also see how some of the history has been made over the years with sports photography being at the forefront. Um, and the stories that go along with it. So I think some of the iconic sports moments um, are iconic because of the photographs around them. Like this, for example, this is, I don't, I don't know, I guess I personally don't know about the fight. I don't really follow it. I never, I, you know, it's, it's a historic moment, but it's, I know the photograph better than I know the story of this moment. Um, and I think that is something that starts to happen with sports photography, but also with photography in general. Um, so I don't know if you um, if you are all sports fanatics, you know, really, really big sports fans. Um, but I found this great series where someone photoshopped Gritty, who's the, the Philadelphia Flyers mascot into famous sports photographs, which I thought was a hoot. Um, so there's a few of them there. And, and there's also images like this one where you have a celebrating player and it becomes really controversial because she took her shirt off um, and that was considered to be a controversial moment. And so you start to get all of these historical like references and you know these become really big things. And so I think that that can also be something if you're not photographing, you know, if you're not photographing the World Cup, you're still photographing a big moment in someone's li life life. So um, there's, there's Gritty again. So there he is again. Um, and I just in sports photography. And so this one, you can see it's not a shallow depth of a field, right? There is Gritty in the bottom left. Um, but it's not a shallow depth of field. So luckily, Jordan is wearing this really red thing. Um, so you can differentiate him, but you can see it's a little more confusing. It's a little bit more like a Where's Waldo than um, what we usually we're doing in sports photography now. So here's another one. You can see the kind of shallower depth of field. The people in the background are just little dots. We can read 49, but he's not the primary person we're, photo we're looking at. We see 81 perfectly extended. We also see Gritty running through the field for fun. Here he is again. <laughs> Um, and this is a really shallow depth of field. And so with this, you have to anticipate where they're going to be. So they're running up the track at a quick speed and you've got a shallow depth of field, meaning if he, if you go out of your line of sight, you know, he's going to be out of focus. So you have to be really cautious when using shallow depth of field. So here's a, another gritty one. <laughs> 
And there's that one with Gritty. And so what do we want from our sports photography? What inspires us? I, I always think of sports movies um, and how that's like never about the actual technique of catching the football, but more about the experience um, that was the, the context for the game and what everyone was going through to get there. And I think that as you're photographing sports, keeping in mind that there's a really rich history with why each player is there is important. So don't feel limited by the access that you have or uh, the tools you're currently using. There are limitations to everything and how will you overcome them? In some one-on-ones, I talked with some folks about this already, but I'm excited to show some photos. So Rich Wade is a friend of mine and he, um, he shoots for WWE now. But a few, maybe a decade ago, that was a far off dream. And he just loved wrestling, loved it. Um, these are his photographs now, absolutely loves to be a part of the wrestling world. But he didn't have access. It's really hard to be, be one of the people ringside taking pictures. So he wanted to practice, um, but you know there aren't really that many amateur rings aside from like inside of a gym, which is just two people sparring. So he ended up um, doing, these are some of his crazy pictures because now he does photograph for WWE. Um, he ended up doing this whole thing. He did, does this now, but in the day, back in the day when he was 15 or 16, he took um, action figures from WWE that he loved uh, from wrestling. And he would then set up in his, in his bedroom and photograph. So these are action figures. They're held up by fishing line, um, lit with a lamp. And he is just like showing the moves that he wants to photograph and showing the, the experience. So you can see some of the fishing line up there. And in some of them, they use these kind of crazy ladders and things. And so he wanted to bring his love of wrestling into photography and like practice what that would look like, do a choreography, I guess, of his own practice with this. And I think that we so often get, you know, oh, I don't have access to WWE, but you can still make that kind of image. And obviously these are very different from the in-person things, but it shows this like passion that you can still create, um, create the, the, in the photographs that you want to create. So if you're looking to photograph a very fancy sports car or um, you know, practice with models, you can practice with Barbies or with Hot Wheels while you like get comfortable meeting with people. And you know, with COVID, it might there, you know, certainly maybe a less dangerous subject for a Barbie doll than uh, a person. So landscape photography, let's get into it. All right. So there's a, a really great, um, there's some really great films about landscape photography um, that I would recommend if you, um, I can send that over. But um, a lot of landscape photography, it is, it is a dedicated, dedicated practice. So if you're going out for landscape photography, you probably want to get like the sunrise and the sunset. And you're probably going to be out in conditions of rain, snow, sleet, with your camera and working hard to get the right shot. Um, and what we can see here is, is clearly the dedication. This is very early in the morning, we think. You know, this is really blue, that blue hour right before dawn. You start to see the sun come up. It looks just cold. It looks so cold. And that's something with landscape photography that you might, you might, you know, it seems like it might be an easy thing, but often to get the shot you're you know, out there in a thunderstorm waiting for the light to strike that one spot. So there's a lot of patience in landscape photography. So this one here, we have that wind blowing the snow and it's a little, um, the shutter is open longer. So the shutter speed is a longer shutter speed to allow that time to pass so that you can see it going over the uh, ice there. So there are so many great photographs of landscape photography. And these aren't as shallow of depth of fields. We can see, you know, the rocks in the foreground and in the background pretty well. Um, we talked about Ansel Adams, uh, you know, last couple of weeks, um, especially this photograph, which I think is a, just beautifully done. Um, 
And Ansel Adams would actually hike around, this was before Yosemite was a national park, with his enormous eight by 10 camera, like 40, 50 pounds of just camera gear, and then like camp out so that he could get the perfect photograph. But he's got this intense backpack of, I mean, it's more than a backpack of stuff that he's hiking through a park that does not, ha- is not a park and does not have any sort of easy system to get through. But it's also something to think about. His photographs actually helped establish, um, you know, send, he sent the photographs to legislators in Washington, D.C. as part of the Sierra Club. And they um, used them as calendars and fundraisers. And he was part of the movement that got the national parks um, implemented because so many people in you know, the legislative body had no idea. They hadn't visited these places. Um, they were never going to visit them. It would, you know, take a year or so, or, you know, it would be a lot of time they would spend, you know, to see these beautiful places. And so Ansel Adams photography actually helped to preserve these places. And, you know, I hope that's something that you're able to understand of the power uh, the visual image can have in preserving places and memories um, and specific moments in the world's, world's history. So these are just really beautiful photographs that he's taken. You can see the detail in the sky, in, in the water and the trees. Um, and you can also look at landscape photography. Instead of just capturing the horizon line, you can focus more specifically on something like this, which is still kind of, to me, a, a landscape, a nature. We're looking at this beautiful, these beautiful roots and the way they're interacting with the ground and everything that's happening here. There's so much texture and organic um, kind of play with it. And it's really beautifully done. This is another Ansel Adams. He was also well known for photographing the desert um, and the moon. So fashion photography, whew. fashion photography is fun. It's really fun. And it is a little different from landscape photography. It's, it can be kind of whatever you want in a lot of ways. So fashion photography. Let's dive in. So fashion photography, you can kind of blend it in a few ways. There's a lot of portraiture involved, but now you also, you also need it to be about the article of clothing or the earring. But you can, a lot of brands want it to be also that like this model is also a representation of the clothes. So this is like, clearly this model's face is very well illuminated but it's the hat with that like silk top that starts to feel very luxurious. And they have this blue background that's kind of complementing the red. And so you're really spending time with both the person and the clothes. And when you're shooting fashion photography, being able to highlight the way clothes move or are used is I think a really great way to do it. So a lot of times they use harsher lighting. Um, They use very stylized models. Um, In studios, they tend to use often like a white backdrop um, that was popularized in the 60s and 70s. Um, And you can also just like, you can go outside. You don't have to be stuck in a studio, even though that's the way it's often been done. Um, And you can use lamps, natural light. You can find playful ways to do fashion photography. So the line of her coat perfectly lines up with this with this terracotta wall. Um, And it's, you get to really have a lot of creative freedom based on who you're photographing for. And, you know, if you, if you're interested in fashion photography, you know, going with your friends to say like a Goodwill or Salvation Army and, you know, spending $20 on some outrageous outfits and then going out to a park and photographing them is really fun and a great way to start to like show off the clothes and learn how they move and how light interacts with them and the stories you want to tell through fashion photography. So, you know, there's, they don't have to be significantly different than portraiture, but it starts to be much more about the clothes than the face. So the one on the left, we clearly have direct eye contact. It's the face is very well lit, but like that, that poof coming out and the, the silk or the velvet, green bow is just really captivating. The one on the right, we can't really see her eyes that well, um, but we can see the, her like the way her legs are in that blue pantsuit with the, with the shoes. It's, it's 
very much about her experience there. Um, and then we have the, <clears throat> so we have some other fun ways to do it. So, you know, it can be about the shoe and you can also dress it up super funny um, and to have it be playful and odd. Um, but you could also do it in more of a traditional style like you see on the right. So again, you can, you know, take a chair out into the woods, um, enjoy sitting there and playing with the light. Um, and on the right, you can see that's pretty much a kind of basic studio image, which is really fun too, but you can also play outside of the studio. <clears throat> So we see the movement of the skirt here. We see, you know, the textures of the scarf jacket. And that's like, as you think about it, playing with those things, playing with movement or stagnation. Um, and, you know, having a model that's also comfortable in front of the camera is really helpful. It's, you know, not required, but it does make a big difference when they, they do all these different poses and can move it around. Um, so we see, you know, we have the lighting here, um, and we have different kind of styles for the movement, but we can see the, you know, um, on the right, we have like, you see that the way the shimmer is going up that dress because she's hiked it up a little bit. Um, it's a really fun way to photograph that. And there's a lot of lot to be said for new and kind of older photography too. Um, and you know, this is a great example of the two of those together. So um, this is a Irving Penn. Um, and it does depend on where you're what you're photographing for. Are you photographing for a boutique in their style? Or are you photographing maybe for um, for your friends? Instagram or, or do you, how, who are you photographing for? Um, and so the, the thing you're photographing also changes how you photograph it. It's so like these stilettos, look at those curves, look at those lines, we've got legs, they're perfectly, perfectly styled, everything's great, look at those. Like the way the harsh light is hitting, we just feel very much like we have that skinny leg, skinny heel thing. These are photographed totally different, also for a fashion organization. Um, the, these shoes are, are photographed with just a gray background. It's a flat photograph. Um, but these are, these are shoes that are much more, I mean, they're, they're supposed to be there. It's a fashion brand, um, but it's photographed very differently to convoke the mood of the shoes. So some famous fashion photographers, we've got Irving Penn, um, and he had, he had a few different setups, but you can see here, he used a lot of the studio, um, studio lighting, and he's using, these are portraits, um, but he also like used soft lighting, window lighting, and um, you can see the kind of consistency, especially in his portraits, um, that he would use just pretty much a very similar lighting setup. And you can see here in the eyes that the light's just coming from kind of front and above there to light up the face. So, um, and then we have Richard Avedon. He was a fashion and portrait photographer. He photographed Twiggy a lot, um, who this is. Um, and you can see, you know, here in Ronald Reagan, that he has a circle light above his face. And then he has one light below. That's probably something more like a, um, like a piece of, like the big piece of paper basically that's gonna shine light back in your face. Here's Avedon again photographing. He loved the studio, loved, um, and this is one of his famous fashion photographs, but it was very much about like Twiggy as a model icon with her hair and the movement. And it's really not about the, any sort of other fashion elements other than the model. Um, and he's photographing the Dalai Lama very differently than fashion models and the way that the dresses are moving and the hats and the form they're making is very different. So he also played around a little bit with elements of surrealism to bring into his commercial work. And you can see on the right, the movement of that piece, you know, the movement of the dress 
the movement of the rope. It's a very different high energy piece than on the left, which is that kind of soft stare. You get a lot of emotion in the face. The run on the right is all about the fashion moment that's happening. Those sparkly, um, sparkly, what are they? Tights, sparkly tights with the heels. And you can see in the image, you can see the sparkles um, really shine through. So he also photographed a lot in Paris and he photographed once with the um, circus because he wanted to photograph this collection with the circus. And so this image becomes one of his most iconic images um, because of the like, movement of the trunks, the movement of the elephants and this like bow gently draping down her front. This is Dovima with elephants. Um, and he used a lot of really soft lighting. Um, and then, <clears throat> ah, sorry. <laughs> um, and then we see Annie Leibovitz. She is one of the most famous portrait photographers in the world right now. Um, and she's been photographing for years, um, very much in this kind of highly stylized um, portraiture work, but also it, within fashion. She photographed for Vogue, Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, um, and she also does promotional images for really high production films um, like Star Wars. She did the Les Mis um, iconic poster. Um, she's photographed everyone from you know Angelina Jolie to Lin Manuel Miranda, and some of these start to. So this is um, Angelina Jolie right before the Snow White. Um, well, I forget the title of that movie. Um, but that Snow White series. And um, so she's with these gargoyles. It's really dark and moody. Um, you know, she's clearly still beautiful Angelina Jolie. She's not some hideous villain, but you get the kind of idea that this this is a woman who might poison you. Um, whereas, you know, this is, this is a woman who's gone through struggles. She has this like comfort in herself too. This is a very much in the Renaissance style of lighting. Um, and he's wearing these kind of old timey clothes and starts to feel like a, you know, like a thinker. And if you know these people, you start knowing their stories, you can piece apart the way that light is being used and the context within the image that these people are telling their stories through the photograph. So she's um, also photographed, uh, this is for the Frida, um, docu not documentary, biopic that, um, that was, a while ago. So she also photographed this for Vanity Fair. Um, and she photographed this for, I think, Rolling Stone, Demi Moore. She's had a huge influence in the way that we understand ourselves and the images that are okay now. This was very controversial, um, very, yeah, very controversial at the time. Um, and there's also a lot of young photographers who have been, you know, they've had a phone in their hands now for the first, you know, 20, 25 years of life now. Um, and so we have, this is Tyler Mitchell, who I think was 21 when he photographed um, a cover for of Beyonce. Um, and he's using some harsher light. He's getting out of the studio. He uses, so this is, and this is a way you can photograph fashion photography. You can hang a bed sheet out in your yard and you can photograph, I mean, look at the beautiful pattern on that bed sheet. And if you zoomed, so he wanted to step back and give it kind of this, you know, we see Beyonce always in this like fancy studio. She's very fancy dressed, but this feels very kind of homemade in a way too. So if you go in, you can like see, it's just a really beautiful pattern and it would have been a beautiful portrait, but he really was telling a lot of stories about Beyonce and symbolism um, through his work here. So, all right, and so these are a few more of his work uh, that you can see. He's photographed a lot for Vogue over the last couple years. I say a couple years because he is like 22, 23. Um, and it's, you know, coming up with creative solutions, like hanging up a sheet in a bedroom. You know, once you like, for if you did those like little selfies, being like, this is the room with the best light, this is the angle with the best light, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set up a situation in here to photograph my favorite dress or I'm gonna go get my favorite, a new, a new favorite outfit. Um, so, and we can see he's using a lot of sunlight in his. So it doesn't have to be studio lighting, it doesn't have to be inside. 
you can just play with the light. And what he's actually doing is having her stare directly at the light. But since since but she can like kind of fake it in a better way than, you know, if if I was smiling at the camera staring at the light. So, and this is inside. Um, so aerial photography has a fun history that we're gonna dive into. Um, so just a quick time check, awesome. So aerial photography, if you don't have a drone, don't worry, that's still cool. Um, so aerial photography is basically, you take photos from above. Um, sometimes you do that with drones, sometimes with, it was used with hot air balloons. Um, but it was also, it's also with like Google Maps. A lot of people use, a lot of people use Google Maps um, when they're, when they want to get good aerial photographs. Um, so yeah, drones are not, they're not inexpensive, but they're not crazy expensive. Um, the training for them, it's not too tricky, um, but it's really interesting to see the world from above. Some, you know, some people get on planes and do it that way too, to photograph. So um, with aerial photography, it tells, it, it can tell a story. Um, and this is an artist, Mishka Henner, who uses aerial photography and Google Maps to kind of examine the world we live in. Um, these might be somewhat disturbing to people. So feel free to take a break for a couple minutes here, which should be no more than three minutes. Um, he photographs agriculture in, um, in different countries from a Google Maps perspective. And um, this is a, this is runoff from a slaughterhouse. And it, you can see it's really beautiful um, the way it's been done. It's a really vibrant image. And I think that's also something as we like encounter photography of thinking what it is. Um, and like, you know, here you can see the, the little, little cows um, and, and what you're trying to say. Um, Cause I think he's, he's interested in taking a stand about different things, but there's also a lot of different ways that like you can do, you know, Ansel Adams style where it's, you know, about raising money for a cause you're really passionate about. And photography can be all sorts of things, you know, it can be pictures of, you know, coal miners and firefighters that help them donate to their pension funds and different things that help people getting where they need to go. Um, this was, I thought was really interesting to see the different kind of patterns of the, of the little, um, of the cow pastures. Um, and these ones, he does this project where if you go on Google Maps and there's a government complex or something there, they do this uh, with them. They try to make it so you can't find them. And so he found, he found a bunch and thought it was pretty fun that this is the world of like, just every like blocked out. You're not, you're not given access to this atop, top view because it is a kind of classified information, but the whole world is photographed. So um, this is Austin Jensen. He photographed, his whole project was along this, the Hudson River. And so he photographed things from above and just like kind of went up and down the river, capturing what was happening there. And that's something you can do too, with or without a drone um, of like, what is it, what does your town look like from Google Maps or Google Street View? You know, what what does Cuba look like? What's a maybe is there a funny moment that they found or an interesting um, interesting kind of scene that you can find? Um, sometimes, like you know, in the past, it's I, I've I've loved to go on Google Google Maps and walk around a place. Um, no drone, no problem. Again, you can take aerial, you can see aerial scenes from above with Google Maps. And I think it's a great way to explore. Documentary photography, we're going to talk real quick about ethics for this one. So, um, so ethics, documentary photography is generally held to a different standard than like fashion photography. You're meant to tell the truth. Um, you have to be very to have a lot of facts. Um, there is bias in everything that we do. We have influences from all over our lives, but we're supposed to be as unbiased as possible and to also express the scene without interfering in any way. So um, this is a caption for a documentary photograph. Firefighter, 
firefighter Michael Dwight carries four-year-old Tina Wilson away from the Friday night fire that destroyed her home. So like, this is a perfect example of some of the information you need if you're going to be a documentary photographer. So if you're like, oh, I'm gonna make a documentary photography project about my high school basketball team. This is some of the information that you might wanna have of like who's on the court at the time or you know what's going on in the scene. So Gordon Parks was a photographer in the 1950s and 60s. He mostly photographed celebrations of black life in New York City. Um, and he, you know, he photographed for decades, um, also was a cinematographer. And some of his photographs ended up becoming inspiration down the line for um, artist uh, Hendrik Lamar, who based an entire um, music video off of Gordon Parks's video, of Gordon Parks's movie, no, photographs. So we can see here some of the same repetition of themes and photographic styles. Um, and this is from a Kendrick Lamar video and then also from uh, Gordon Parks. So, um, and Elliot Erwitt. So documentary photography became really popular in the 50s um, as a way to document this kind of changing world post-World War II. Um, we can see Tech opens, <laughs> Carnegie Tech. So uh, he photographed Pittsburgh in 1950 and it created this great record of what was happening in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, if you've ever been on the bridges, you kind of probably know what that one is. Um, and I mean, that's still the same things that you see in downtown Pittsburgh now. Um, that's the same rail there. So <clears throat> it's also something to think about how how you go about photographing your subjects is there maybe an organization you want to um, kind of follow for a week or a month or a year is there someone who you want to tell their story is there uh you know is your neighbor someone who you're like they would be the perfect subject for a documentary photo series is it just you and your life do you want to share more information in a fun way um martin parr again uh, we're looking at all of these different people who were on vacation. So what he would do on vacation, he'd just go and he'd photograph people um, and, you know, telling their stories, you know, that dripping sticky mess of children and uh, ice cream cones that have long melted um, of like, you know, that perfect pedicure that you've given, you've gotten, you have this beach experience. This image, I think, is a really <laughs> fun fun and uh, perhaps troubling is you have this like teenage girl who's selling ice cream cones at the beach. And then you have these boys, the one boy is like staring right at her chest. She is done with it. You can see her face. She just wants to go home. She is bored out of her mind and is tired of sticky children giving her cash. Um, and <laughs> she's like sassing the photographer in a way. And then you have all these like clamoring sticky kids that you can just like, you can almost smell the like, ocean and sugar combining together in this place. And it's, I think this is something that can be really fun to do of like, you know, is, is this happening at your at concession stands at schools near you? Is it, you know, and, and it's different now, you know, this is a, if we took this image today, it would be a, you know, kind of COVID restrictions would give it a totally different spin. So, and I mean, what an image, what an image. So, when you're going places, there, there are going to be times where you're like, this is, this is beautiful. And you're going to want a camera and you probably always have one on you if you have your phone. Um, and this was his, uh, he had, he has a lot of images. Um, but it's, it's also kind of a playful way of documenting. It's not documentary photography does not have to be here is the opioid crisis in Northeastern Ohio. It can be these people are on vacation and aren't we a little ridiculous? Um, it, it, it can be a little bit more enjoyable. Um, and so that's just something I want you to kind of embrace is that photography can document the best parts of the world. Um, and <clears throat> this is great, the texture of the hair, this is wonderful. Um, and so documentary photography um, you can also document yourself in a bunch of different ways. So if you've ever taken a self portrait, a selfie, you are kind of getting into that documentary tradition of capturing yourself. 
these are his self-portraits. So he decided that everywhere he would go, he would take a self-portrait in the style of the place. So if you've ever gone to like Myrtle Beach, there's like, oh, take a picture with a shark. Um, and so he would do that everywhere he would go. So this is, he went to Holland and he went to a studio and they set the whole scene up for him, generated him into it. Um, he went to Pearl Harbor and this was one of the photo shops. So it's not like he's doing this himself. He goes into a literal shop. This is the photograph they take, print it out and they hand it to him. So he has a lot of those where like, <laughs> he's photographed in the style of the place. And you know, he goes to LA and they're like, perfect. We'd love to put your head on Arnold Schwarzenegger. Are you ready? And he's like, absolutely. Um, so wherever he goes, he tries to find these novelty photo shops so that he can get these kind of ridiculous self-portraits. And, and you know, self-portraits don't have to be absolutely beautiful works of art. They can be also a little ridiculous, just like everything in life can be a little bit playful pretty much. So I think this one, this one was one of his first ones. And so we get to like watch him age through this kind of crazy process. So, um, so we are going to talk a little bit about Dorothea Lang. Um, she photographed for in the Dust Bowl. Um, that's her on top of a car. So if you're looking for inspiring women from the 1930s, she's a great one to pick. Um, she photographed a lot of what was going on during the Great Depression. And the U.S. government actually paid for a group of photographers to go out and capture what was happening because they couldn't quite communicate how bad things were in the Midwest with the legislative bodies being in DC. And so they wanted these photographs to record what was happening, but also to get the stories of people and get a visual and help maybe um, change some of the legislation to better these people's lives and give them the you know help that they would need. So if you've ever seen Free Solo, um, which you, it's a it's a climbing film. It's really fun, um, but this is Jimmy Chin, and he is a documentary photographer, filmmaker, um, and he basically does these crazy things like hikes up Everest with you know all of his cameras and photographs the people he's with going up these crazy worlds. Um, and and this is another example of how photography can kind of meet you wherever you are if you are on top of you know the world's highest peak it can be there with you to document it. And using it as a tool to, um, is, is really powerful. Um, he also photographed this very kind of um, intense scene where this gentleman climbed up Yosemite's, um, one of Yosemite's walls uh, without any ropes. So if he were to fall here, then that is uh, you know not gonna be a good solution. So you can really meet your passions wherever they are. This is Jimmy Chin um, photographing um, along that project. So, and you notice that it's like a totally different style than we see with, you know, lay flat photography. You can see, you know, this is Jimmy Chin again. And like here we have all the textures going down. We have the person climbing up. We have all sorts of information. So. We, I have, I have so much more because photography genres really is endless. Um, I think I'm going to respect your time today and not go over with that. Oh, I'm going to stop sharing and not go over with that because real, realistically, when I first made it, I had 500 slides and I cut down a few of them because I was like, that's insane. We can't do that um, because there's just so much and it could be, you know, anything from how you want to photograph your life to where does photography meet you? Like any of your hobbies, photography can, if you're like, I really like to knit, photography can make it easier for you to sell your knitwares. Um, so it's great and I love it. And there's, it, it meets you wherever, every genre of photography. I'm like, there's 600 more genres. We should add them all. Um, so we're going to do a little bit more of that next week as well as kind of rounding out some of the things. If there's anything specifically that you want to talk about or um, really dive into, let me know. We are going to be doing a little um, editing uh, breakout uh, one of these days. So I'll be sending with a few different times um, and it'll be not really more than 15 or 30 minutes. Um, we're going to dive into Lightroom and then talk about a few different editing techniques you can do. 
Um, Lightroom is an Adobe product, so it would be something that you would pay for on a monthly basis, but it's not something that you need. It's just a editing tool if you're, say, editing a lot of photographs. Um, if you're just editing a few, then it could be something more like editing on Instagram, for example, is not a bad thing if you're trying to just like post to Instagram. So it's more getting the kind of feel for what a photograph is, I think, right now, and then we can play around a little bit. So I'll be sending out that information this week. If you want to schedule any one-on-ones, please let me know. I'm happy to do that. Um, Jenna wrote in the chat, um, I used one called Snapseed from Google. It's free and has a lot of features. Awesome. Well, we can talk about Snapseed then next week too. Um, so, and then are they using Flash for these shots? Carol, I missed that in the chat, so I have no idea which ones we are talking about now, but maybe. So it's a 50-50 at this point, um, but I can, I can maybe see when that was timed up with, but um, the food ones. Ah, the food ones. So the setup is basically there's a, there's a window. So like I have a window there and I would Maybe I would cover it a little bit so it's not as harsh lighting with like a sheet, a white sheet, or even a piece of paper. So like I have my my bagel here. And so I would have a piece of paper here to diffuse the light, but not hide the light. So like my hand is going to hide the light, but a thin piece of paper is still going to let light pass through it. Um, and then I might have a piece of paper here to bounce more light back into it. So it's playing with it, but it's really just window lighting and then a couple different things to bounce window lighting back onto the food so but generally people don't use flash for food photography so cool well i'll wrap that up today if you have any questions or want to do your one-on-one -on -one this week please let me know um my email is hharley at sama-art.org which i just put into the chat um and thank you everybody for joining us this week happy saturday um, outside against the sun going down, but being able to see in person, Fran, you said, oh, being able to see the person. So generally you want the sun, you want to make sure that you can see the face and you do that by controlling your manual settings because your phone, your camera or phone is going to be like, whoa, this is far too bright. And that's, it's backlight. Um, and depending on if you're like at, say, the beach, the beach is a notoriously hard one to do because there's nothing interrupting that light. And so it's there's no other light coming back. So a lot of people use flash if they're trying to get a sunset view. Um, but if you're trying to get, you know, that golden hour right before sunset, you can still use backlighting. Um, and we talked about that a little bit in portraiture last week with the halo of light around the head, but I can expand upon that next week if we want to talk more about that. So, um, but yeah, so I, I do want to be respectful that it is 12.03. So thank you all so much for coming um, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thanks everybody.